Welcome to Roadcase, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Okay, everyone, welcome back to Roadcase. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg. I'm really psyched to be here. Thanks for joining me for this special episode. We got tons of great episodes coming up, so stay tuned to the uh, to our socials. And um, I'll remind you, if you'd like to uh, get involved in the Roadcase community, and I want to thank those of you that have supported Roadcase on Patreon, and um, I'd like to thank you for that. And uh, if you'd like to get involved with the Roadcase community, you can do that at Patreon. And that's um, at patreon.com slash roadcase pod. Um, and for the price kind of a cup of coffee, uh, you can get early episode, early access to the episodes and uh, some goodies there as well. It's a great way to support Roadcase, and I appreciate those of you that do. And if you'd like to get involved with the community uh, in other ways, you can email me at info at roadcasepod.com uh, with your questions, concerns, uh, talk to me about uh, the weather, what have you. Um, you can also follow Roadcase on the socials. Uh, that would be Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, as you well know, and our handle is Roadcase. Po- at Roadcase Pod. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, Roadcase Podcast. Another great way to support Roadcase is to rate and review this podcast and to subscribe to it on your favorite listening platform. In fact, if you're listening right now on a platform, if you can pause it and rate it and uh, maybe even throw down a great review, that would be awesome. Um, it's a great way and uh, doesn't cost anything, but it really helps us and uh, supports Roadcase. So, uh, thanks in advance for that. And I appreciate it and allows us to keep bringing you these great episodes. And today is no exception. And I'm really excited to welcome to the show rock critics, Jim DeRogatis and Greg Cott, both hosts of the, the rock and roll talk show sound opinions, which was, uh, on public radio, the WBEZ channel, uh, the NPR channel in Chicago and sound opinions is now an independent podcast, which you can tune into on your favorite listening platform. Jim wrote rock criticism for the Chicago Sun Times and Greg uh, was the rock critic at uh, the Chicago Tribune. Uh, They're also both notable authors. Greg has written a book on Wilco, Learning How to Die, and uh, Jim's written a number of books. most notably, the biography on Lester Bangs called Let It Bur- Blurt, Life and Times of Lester Bangs. Uh, he also wrote a book um, on uh, psychedelic rock, Turn On Your Mind, uh, Four Decades of Psychedelic Rock, and also Staring at Sound, uh, the true story of Oklahoma's famous The Flaming Lips. Um, so these guys both come by it honestly, and to, to be able to chat with them about music was was a real honor for me. Um, we talked about live music and how that figures into their uh, overall criticism of a band and what it means for a band to be able to perform uh, live, perform those songs live versus just on an album. So it's interesting to hear them talk about that and why uh, live shows are so important and uh, why it's so cool to uh, go and debrief after a show and why it's so difficult to turn around and write about the feelings that you get from a live show. And uh, so we'll get that right from the source from these two amazing rock critics. Uh, we'll talk about some amazing shows that they've seen uh, in the past, uh, most notably uh, Nirvana um, during the Nevermind tour at the Metro, which is um uh, which is an amazing show to see. Uh, I was not there, but uh, we'll also talk about the show shutdown and how that's affecting independent venues. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about Live Nation, uh, trying to buy up small uh, local independent venues and how that's going to hurt the music business and hurt local music in particular. This is a really special interview for Roadcase. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jim and Greg again for being here and taking the time to chat with me briefly. Thanks to all of you for joining me for this very special episode on Roadcase. So here we go.
All right. Hey, guys. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, man? To the extent yeah. that that's even a relevant question in 2021. Yeah. <laughs> 2021. Yeah. You're, you're, you're losing I almost track. said 2020. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. Well, what is time anymore? It's a circle. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe things will change after uh, well, a certain swearing in tomorrow. Yeah, we, I think we have the countdown is less than 24 hours now, so that's good. Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about live music, um, how that kind of bargains into rock criticism. I'm sort of curious because, hmm. you know, read a lot about you guys um, – uh, with you know, cr- uh, doing rock criticism for albums and uh, artists, etc. But Jim, let's start with you. Like, how what is kind of the role of live music for you as a critic? Well, you know, I mean, I was at the Sun Times as pop music critic for uh, 10, 12 years, and uh, yeah. so a lot of reviews, you know. Uh, you know, Mary J. Blige to Britney Spears, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Nick Turner of Hawkwind to uh, uh, Naked Ray Gun Reunion, you know, uh, you, yeah. you, you cover the waterfront. I think the best uh, way I've ever heard it described uh, in the role of a rock critic, uh, my buddy Jim Testa, uh, first person who ever published me, fanzine uh, from New Jersey called Jersey Beat, once mm-hmm. for the Paz and Jop poll uh, wrote an essay, there's two types of critics. There's the club rats who, uh, you know, obviously consume records voraciously, but also shows. And then there's uh, the Robert Criscows of the world who sit mm-hmm. in their apartment and listen nonstop to records. And I yeah. think that, uh, you know, there's an element to it that you don't get if you haven't also seen a band live. For sure. So obviously it's been a painful withdrawal since March 17th of last year. Oh, March uh, 17th was your last one? Uh, I think it was, that was my last show, yeah. Um, or we oh, I, was, a, I, I, I quit early on March 11th. <laughs> well, I was waiting for the official shutdown in Chicago, and it came right after St. Patrick's Day when all those drunken idiots... Uh, oh right, yeah, drinking. yeah. I had tickets to like a March twelfth show at Shuba's with Ala Loss. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I just I bagged it. I, I got the jitters after I I was in. I was in. I was at the Madison in Kentucky and uh, mm-hmm. in, in Covington to see Goose and Pigeons Playing Bing Bong. So I had my great live jam band fill just as the last hurrah. Yeah, I don't think that was actually my last show. I think the last thing was a live taping we did, right, Greg? With yeah, Sudan we did Sudan archives, archives and uh, that was at uh, Little Village. That was at Little Village, and that was in early March. I I think it was like yeah. the week before yeah. uh, the shutdown yeah. occurred. Yeah. But, you know, I so, mean, there, there's anyway. a third element that I think really enhances my criticism is that uh, I'm not a musician, but I am a drummer. All right. Yes, I know that. And I had written a piece for The New Yorker uh, in May uh, when we were a mere six or eight weeks into this shutdown. And, and uh, the band has rehearsed for a decade at a place called Superior Street. And it's a big uh, warehouse, uh, block long, two stories tall. With, uh, that has been carved up into perhaps 150 or 200 rehearsal rooms. And, wow. you know, walking the hallways on a Saturday, we rehearse every Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Yeah. And uh, it, is, it is catharsis and it is joy for us. <laughs> uh, you know, and, um, you know, you hear coming out of the doors, uh, you know, uh, salsa bands and funk bands and hip hop along with a little cloud of uh, pot smoke and, uh, you know, space rock, uh, you know, and, and uh, metal and death metal and my punk band. And you get a sense of the vibrant... Uh, scene of Chicago in a way that you wouldn't unless you happen to go to 10 or 15 different clubs all the time. Right? Man, I should spend some time there. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Uh, except, my friend, that it has been silent, largely silent, uh, you know, since last March, you know, yeah, and I, yeah. I think that bands are not gathering, you know, Vortis still does, uh, masked all three of us, and, and we're like the only ones there. You know, mm-hmm. there may be one drummer rehearsing solo. And to well, me, do you think that's, yeah, go ahead. Do you well, think it's from it, a safety it, standpoint, it, it, or is it just like bands are not going on the road, so they're like, look, fuck yeah. it, we're not going to tour. Yeah, we're not ba- going to practice. Ba- bands are not playing out, so then, therefore, why do we practice? You know, because uh, you love music and you love playing. Maybe I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know. I know. And I'm sure there's other factors. I mean, there's no musician yeah. who's making uh, her livelihood playing at Superior Street, you know. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so so uh, there's day job considerations. And how much do you want to expose yourself if you're uh, also working, you know, um, 
doing takeout orders at a restaurant or uh, working at Walgreens or whatever. You know, I, I, it's just, um, you know, it, to me, that was the, uh, the singular evidence of how sad uh, this, this uh, besides missing shows as a listener, uh, as a yeah. musician, uh, singular evidence of the impact on, on an entire community in the arts. Oh yeah, it's it's yeah. I mean, you can't under you can't overstate it really. No. Um, but when you're looking at a band, uh, and Greg, you know, feel free to jump in any time. But I mean, if you guys are looking at a band, how much does the live performance of that band, that's separate from their studio recordings, how much does that influence you in what you will say or talk about or write about um, in uh, in your criticism? Well, uh, I can tell you from my perspective, I mean, I covered, um, you know, live shows for 30 years at the Chicago Tribune um, up until last year. And, uh, you know, I think I once was asked, how many shows did you cover? And I sort of did some mental math on it, like over 2,000, over wow. 2,000 shows. And um, I would start every year, early part of every year, South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, big music conference. It was very small when it started, but it was still a great uh, you know, pooled a lot of a lot of bands from all over the world every year, and you know, going to see those bands there, where you have this concentrated dose of music over a five-day span at every club in in town, uh, you get to see probably you know if you're if you're really ambitious, you could see 10, 10 12 bands a day. So I would I would have a sort of a running start on who I wanted to cover every year at that festival, uh, at that conference, uh, because live performance to me was really a critical measuring stick for, you know, how good a band was. I mean, you know, in the recording studio, uh, you can, you can sort of, uh, mask some flaws that a band might have, you know, it's a, is it a real band? Is it, you know, how, how, how good is this artist really? Yeah. Is it a producer doing this or is it a, is, is this a real artist? Right, and right. you know you can measure an artist by seeing them live. You know, I, I, Corey Rusk of Touch and Go uh, Records used to always say, "I would never sign a band until I saw them live." You know, it wasn't like I wasn't I wasn't signing bands off demos. I had to go yeah. see them in performance, and that such a critical part of the industry uh, back then. The industry, what a horrible word for people who love music. You know, that that's what really mattered. That that's how I got inspired to write about music in the first place. Was standing you know, six feet in front of uh, this great band in Chicago, 11th Dream Day, on, on a tiny stage at a, at a godforsaken club on a drug corner in Chicago, and, um, you know, b blown away by them, just saying, I got I to gotta write about this band for the Tribune. That's how I started writing about rock and roll in the Trib. And, uh, you know, the point is now the, that is shifting because what we're seeing with, with COVID and everything is, you know, we're, we, we're, everything's, everything's inside, everything's... Um, you know, everybody's sort of sheltering in place. Uh, you're not being able to see bands. You're already starting to see this in music in general, where the show is less an important part of the element of what an artist presents to the world than, than the recording. Um, and at the same time, the weird part about that is the recordings are, you know, priced, you know, there, there's basically no value in recorded music anymore from a, uh, a commercial standpoint. So once we get back, you know, once, once we do get back, to business as usual, whenever that will be, uh, uh, there's going to be bands knocking down the doors to get out there on the road and, and make a little bit of money. You know, it's kind of like we're we're long overdue to start seeing live music again, and the bands themselves are suffering because they're unable to sort of ply their wares on the road. Which is, to me, again, that's the that's the heart and soul of what we do. I mean, the the live show is 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 where it's at. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, bands are definitely going to be like trying to get out there as quickly as possible and are definitely hurting. Do you kind of feel the same way, Jim? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the luxury of not being at the Daily anymore is that I don't have to review the Britney Spearses of the world anymore, <laughs> yeah. you know. Right. So I've uh, felt liberated, uh, you know, paying the rent as a, as a professor at Columbia College and now uh, doing uh, criticism, you know, whether it's for The New Yorker, whether it's for uh, Sound Opinions, you know, but having the freedom to go see stuff that I'm excited about, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is liberating because I think the downside of, uh, of having to professionally review so many shows, and I'm sure it's the same for every stagehand sound engineer, you know, is, is it, uh, the amount of crap, right? And it can kill the joy. 
And yeah. I was finding uh, I was finding just the joy coming back in a tremendous way uh, for not having to be there, but wanting to be there. So I am missing that, and I think what Jim Testa meant in that in that club rats versus uh, uh, you know uh, you know listening at home uh, comparison he made of the kinds of critics is it's really only half the story. If you want to understand an artist and what they're really about, um, you know, I mean, Savages uh, made two uh, brilliant albums before they kind of fell apart. You know, Idols is on their second greatest album, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you don't really understand those bands until you see them live yeah. you know and feel the bass drum uh reverberating in your chest and see that's what those, I, I, I miss that the most of all like, know? live shows is the yeah the amped kick drum but the physical sense you know right right i mean there's no there's no question live music is important that's what i like to look at a road case from so, from all kinds of different perspectives um when you are which so jim i mean would you prefer to write only on live shows I mean, how integral oh, no, is no, no, no. A, a band's live performance to what you're going to write about, like their latest release? Is that kind of where you start, or would and and I guess there's also sort of thinking like a band like Wilco or a band like Flaming Lips or My Morning Jacket, whose live shows are legendary. Where do you start with them from your own perspective? And I'd love to hear Greg's answer on that too. I, I want a great record, and to me, a great record is. Uh, is a collection of great songs. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, the notion that the album is dead, I think, is BS. Um, you know, artists still choose. I mean, think about that word album. We have photo albums of our family yeah. and yeah, growing up at high yep. school. You know, it's a recorded uh, document of a uh, of an artist a, at a, a certain, moment in time, a too, certain when place you, in of time. Of their yes. creative um, yes. efforts at that moment. The producer they choose, where right. their mindset is at, where they choose to produce that album and record yeah. that album, and who's and in then the there's band, the lyricist, you know. like what he's doing, yeah, right, you know, and and then okay, uh, so yeah, I mean, ultimately the albums live on, um, yeah, you know, even in the case of of I remember, you know, a New Year's Eve show where Husker Du takes the stage at Maxwell's in Hoboken, capacity 150, and they say we're going to play our new album, it's not out yet, and they play Zen Arcade. Right. In its entirety, beginning to yeah. end. Right. And that that was a wonderful experience. I think I remember it accurately. And there are now, you know, <laughs> thanks to fans, there are recordings of that set and stuff. Right. But, you know, nothing's going to replace being in that room that night. However, having Zen Arcade uh, to listen to whenever, in whatever circumstance, on whatever piece of gear I choose. I mean, it's the album that's immortal. And it was the uh, uh, the the night that was ephemeral, uh, ephemeral. But I think you need both <laughs> to really. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, the night is the the night lives in the memories of those that were there. And fortunately, there are those that recorded it and then distributed it, et cetera. I mean, yeah. you know, it's the the old Grateful Dead model of just you know we'll record an, a performance and you guys can have it, and then it just lives on just like an album does, but also. There are albums as a work of art, which is important. Yeah, for sure. So I, right. you know, I wouldn't want to choose, uh, uh, you know, between either. <laughs> you know, yeah, only. So. You know, why? Why not? I can have both. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Greg, what about you? Well, you know, I reviewed a lot of shows, as I said, and I, I love yeah. that adrenaline rush of, you know, coming back on a deadline. I mean, people think, well, what was your life like, you know, as a writer? You, you usually, you know. You, you know, would you write the next day about the show? No, I would write right after the show. The show's over and you're, you're filing a, uh, a review on deadline. And people said, that sounds awful. I said, no, I, I loved it. I, I lived for that. I mean, I got, I got good at it because I did so many of them. I mean, you screw up often enough, you finally figure out how to do it right. And, um, you know, I, I felt really comfortable in that space. Like, I was so pumped, so... Full yeah. of adrenaline coming back from a show. I mean, there's nothing more exciting than seeing a great show. Um, and, you know, across the board, you know, I still remember D'Angelo in 2000 yeah. after uh, the Voodoo album came out. You know, yeah. it was just um, those kind of moments stick in your mind. And, you, re you know, there, it is ephemeral, you know, and even the bootleg or the live recording of the show Not doesn't. The doesn't do it justice. No, no, no. You, know, you don't get the energy. Do you it. still don't get the energy of the fans, and you don't get the yeah. energy of the room. And you, you probably and just really, having I'll all never, these people together. I'll, I'll never probably, forget being uh, being at uh, Metro for Nirvana mm. on the Nevermind tour. The first time they played wow. a tour, 
And I remember the atmosphere in that room so vividly. It was like, it was electric. There was just like a feeling in the air of something amazing was going to happen. And it was the first time I'd seen Grohl with the band as the drummer. Because I'd seen Nirvana a bunch of times before that Grohl wasn't drummer yet. And all of a sudden it just exploded. It just became one of those moments where I vividly, you know, like my mind's, the, the photo, the camera in your brain captures these certain vivid moments that you just will never forget. And even though I don't have a, a recording of that per se, the memory of that show lives on. And it was, you know, that, that to me is like, you know, one of those things you'll take to your grave. You know, you won't forget yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. See, see, I mean, Josh, maybe Nirvana, I, I think, yeah, I go ahead, Jim. You've probably had this experience, right, where you've been to a show. There's nothing that beats the uh, 1.30 in the morning rock and roll eggs. Right. You go to the diner and you have that <laughs> that, that, that middle of the night breakfast. Right. And, and I mean, so what the way we both approach criticism and the whole idea of sound opinions is right. you go to yeah. a show, it could be a play, it could be a movie, uh, it could be an art opening. Right. And then you go with your friends and you have coffee or you have a couple of drinks or you have those rock and roll eggs in the middle <laughs> of the night yeah. and you talk about what you just saw. And it was amazing, right? <laughs> right. And, and this is the, the, the conversation that happens between people who are passionate about the art form. That is criticism. That's what we try to capture. Right. We just captured that verbally. I don't know. I, it feels like it's harder to capture in, a writ, in written format, for sure. I mean, you know, three, we're, we're music lovers. We're sitting around talking about how awesome it is to see a show. Yeah, I totally agree, and I'm completely there. Um, it translates better verbally, I think, than it does on on the page. Well, yes and no. You know, I, I mean, don't know about if, that, if, man. I, yeah, I, I, I disagree I know, with that. Yeah. You know, if we heard, well, you just made that argument. You it, said like that's 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 what it is. That's we're we're at the diner and we're all like vibing about how great well, the I show like, was. I like that too, but I, I just said I just made the argument that I loved writing about it and that yeah. and that energy yeah, that I, I got from that. I tried to put that in in words, and yeah. maybe I did a lousy job of it. But I felt like I, no, I got something off my chest, you know. I got something that I needed to say in that moment. Yes. And I was glad no, to have yeah. that moment. You know, yeah. and, and the, 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 the gang of folks uh, having those midnight eggs uh, with their ears ringing and, and a little buzz on from the show, uh, you know, don't have the set list in front of them, uh, aren't making the connections, or didn't write down uh, the stage patter, or, yeah, or didn't, yeah, nece yeah. didn't necessarily see anything. You know, uh, the last show Nirvana played at the Aragon, since he mentioned uh, Nirvana, you know, I mean, Cobain got got pissed off that some jag off used the Chicagoism was yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know well, and and he took off his converse and he threw him at the guy's head <laughs> and then he jumped into the audience and the show ended after a hot twenty minutes they played two nights on the In Utero tour and the first night at the Aragon was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life and the second night was a complete and utter train wreck and you had to see both wow. in order to understand it right oh, but yeah, I absolutely. you know in my privileged perch in the balcony I could see I could hear I could figure out the set list we were sitting next to uh, Jim Merlis, You yeah. and Me, Greg. And the first night they played this song that they'd never, uh, they played a couple songs they'd never played before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they played uh, a cover, Jesus Don't Want Me for a Sunbeam, right? Uh, by the Vaseline, super obscure song. And me wow. and Merlis and Cot are trying to figure it out. And, uh, you know, each, without letting each other know, because we're competitors, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, but by the time we wrote that review that night, we knew what that song was and could say what Cobain was doing by covering that song. Right. 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 Um, you know, uh, I don't know. So so it, it, it's kind of like the conversation at the diner, but enhanced because we had to get our facts right. <laughs> mm. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we knew who the, to call, are, you know. What is the most challenging thing about trying to translate a performance, such an incredible performance like that, for example, uh, to a review, to written words on a page? Well, you know, it's, you're, you're looking at a blank page or a blank screen. Um, you, know, you know, you're starting from scratch. People say, well, you're just, you know, leeching off the artist. I mean, staring at a blank screen with 40 minutes to write something intelligent is a challenge in itself. Yeah, and I always absolutely. say, and I, I, I grew up reading great criticism, what I considered great criticism, you know, whether it was by Ellen Willis or Graham Marcus, you know, um, all these people that I looked up to as a kid. Um, and, and they made the, they made the music come alive for me. It was like, it was jumped off the page. And uh, that that's the goal. I, I, I always thought that great writing uh, is is, a, is an art form, and 
you know, being able to write about art is, is, a, is a form of art in, it, in itself because it's, it's expression, it's self-expression. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not just writing a, 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 you know, a dull boilerplate encyclopedia entry. You're writing about your feelings about something, you know, pouring that out and in some ways making yourself vulnerable, you know. Um, right. So I always thought that was that was really important part of it, sort of channeling those feelings and not being um, not being intimidated by by the whole notion of of putting into words something that you've just seen. You know, uh, what was the famous uh, whoever said it, Frank Zappa or whoever is attributed, you know, Martin write, Mull. writing <laughs> writing about rock music is like writing uh, is like dancing about architecture. No, it's about right. It, it's like writing about. Uh, anything. It's about writing about the weather. It's right about writing this about the city council. It's about writing a, yeah. a painting. You know, good. There's great writing and there's bad writing. You know, and you, right. you want to be in the in the in the great writing category if you can. You don't always get there, but that's what you're aspiring to do, to to somehow yeah. you know express what you just saw. It's a good goal. It's a good goal for sure. Yeah. Um, when Greg, when has uh, your opinion of a live show colored the way that you've critiqued an album or an artist? Uh, all the time. Um, yeah. I think you know I, I've seen bands uh, and artists fail, uh, in, you know, in, in a live setting, and kind of like, oh, okay, that was disappointing, you know. And and there's some artists that are just you realize they're, they're kind of more. That's their home. They're, the recording studio is where they're at their best, and they're not necessarily the greatest live act. And vice versa. I've seen bands that are you know, not so good at recording. You know, they don't make a great record, but, man, they're incredible live. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, um, yeah. A lot of bands have difficulty figuring out how to translate what they're able to do on a stage in a recording studio. That's the biggest problem I've heard, uh, really, uh, rather than vice versa. It's... it's, it's the live thing is where they they're most alive and they're most engaged, and the recording studio is a foreign is foreign turf for a lot mm -hmm. of them. So it's usually like the reverse part of the process. Great live band, not so great uh, in the recording studio. You know, vice versa. You know, there are, it's probably a l l lesser percentage. You know, but that's just kind of a, a gut call on my part. Yeah, Jim, same feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'll quote Steve Albini, who has no use for me, but that's okay. I've seen some great <laughs> Steve Albini shows. Um, you know, where he says, you know, he doesn't consider a band to be a band unless they can do what they do in a room together, right? right. And that, that holds, uh, for. Uh, that's why I was talking about Superior Street, <laughs> you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that is the heart. That is the nexus. People coming together. It's, uh, I think, the only way that two human beings get closer to each other besides a group of people making music in the moment is having sex. You know, I think there's a <laughs> telepathic communication that yeah. begins to happen when the sex is good or the music making is good. And yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm influenced all the time by seeing uh, what bands... And sometimes you see bands uh, or artists live that... Uh, I mean, who would ever think that the Orb could put on a, a riveting show, Dr. The Alex Pat Patterson. You know, at the height of the original techno movement uh, in the 90s, you know, the Orb's making these wonderful spacey trance out records. And, you know, uh, he was there on stage playing the mixing board. You know, but it was brilliant. It was a brilliant performance. Playing the mixing board? He hmm. played the mixing board. He had a 24-track mixing board. Uh, he had one, uh, he had, I think he was augmented by a drummer. Remember that show at the Riv? Yeah, Yeah. I do. And it was extraordinary. Or or Kraftwerk, you know. Uh, Greg and I Sounds saw a little it. bit like what Sylvan Esso does, too. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've seen incredible artists. And, you know, some uh, somebody like Tune Yards, Meryl Garbus. Until mm -hmm. you, you know, her records are great, and they're brilliant. And then you see her live and realize that she plays, uh, you know, four or five notes on the guitar, samples them, <laughs> loops them, and then yeah. does, does a vocal, Arr! you know, Mm -hmm. And then samples and loops it. And then you suddenly have this orchestra built in front of you with one woman. You know, right. and, and it's right. so so the records you and but, you know, you have to have both <laughs> again. You know, it, it, that would be a neat trick. Uh, you know, I used to when I was a kid growing up in New York on Saturday afternoons, the Electro Harmonics Emporium. Uh, you know, 48th Street uh, in Manhattan was Music Row, and there were uh, eight or ten uh, music stores. And the electroharmonics people had their own store to sell their pedals. And every hour on the hour on Saturdays, they would do a 15-minute, uh, uh, you know, um, 
display uh, of, of the, the gear they had, right? Complete with a laser light show, mm. right? And the guy would play, you know, the 10 or 15 pedals Electro Harmonics was selling, <laughs> the loopers, the synths, the fuzz box, right? And it was wonderful, you know, but it was just... It was just nerdy geekery, you know. That wasn't yeah. really a show, you know. Um, you know, you can go to any guitar center in America and watch some dweeb sitting there uh, playing tasty licks. You know, <laughs> that ain't a show either. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, so so it has to be more than just uh, displaying your virtuosity or your gear. It, yeah. it has to be real. I mean, you know, there's a duality to it, right? I mean, there's an important place for live to, for live music. There's an important place for studio albums, especially um, in criticism. What about uh, where do you guys stand on live music films and how that kind of fills an artist's oeuvre, wow. uh, so to speak, and know. how those should be considered? Or I mean, I know there's been some real duds, and I know there's been some great ones. I, I just fewer thought, fewer great ones then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> much, much fewer. I did say some. Yeah, yeah, first, yeah, first, yeah, yeah. First one that pops into my head as a great concert film is to "Stop Making Sense." Um, mm -hmm. You know, you had a director there who totally got the band, understood how to film them. You know, um, I mean, it was uh, it was, and then you had a band who was innately theatrical. Uh, you understood how to how to uh, construct a show in a way that would play as a sort of almost like a play or a, a dramatic movie with a beginning, middle, and end. Right, right. Uh, so Jonathan Demi understood that they were there was a lot of energy there between performer and director, and uh, you know that that's the movie. I mean, it's famously people get up and dance during that movie. They feel like they're yeah. at the show. Yeah, I mean that movie doesn't happen without David Byrne also. So. Yeah. And but, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I think that, that, that from a musician perspective, you know, I, I've loved my whole life Pink Floyd live at Pompeii, right? Just mm -hmm. to watch Gilmore yeah. making those incredible sounds, to see Nick Mason behind the drums. Uh, I mean, that is truly, I don't know if it's a good movie. It probably isn't, right? But, but as a musician or even just as a fan of the band, the intimate up close bird's eye view of what each musician is doing and it's yeah. only four guys right you see pink floyd uh you know when they still toured uh and it's a, a, you know 24 or 28 people on stage you know <laughs> not yeah. to mention a hundred people in the road crew right and these are four guys who get the idea because they're stoned uh let's go to pompeii what if we played in an arena in pompeii Right. Man, you know, without the British <laughs> or Dude, play in it's... front of the pyramids in Egypt. For yeah, you know, and it, and it's it's phenomenal. Uh, but you know, again, it's a simulacrum of the live experience. You know, uh, yeah. but I have a perspective on this, right? I, you know, uh, uh, having toured with Wire as Wire's opening act, playing older music, an album in its entirety that Wire was not going to play at that point. You know, Wire's contention was that my silly cover band from New Jersey um, uh, was better at playing Pink Flag in 1987 than Wire itself would have been because the music mattered more to us. So I did not see <laughs> wow. Genesis play uh, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, but I saw that Genesis tribute band do it, and it was great! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm glad I have the album. I'm glad I saw them do that. Yeah, I mean, there is also the factor of just having the sound in a big room. I mean, there's that, yeah. right, from a live performance. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. there you can't, you know, I mean... I grew up in a dark theater also just watching uh, Song Remains the Same, which people hate, but God, I was a Zeppelin kid, you know? Well, I, I mean, know, and in that Bon, you know, to see Bonham do Moby Dick and how he's <laughs> pressing yeah. his fingers into the floor tom and all this stuff, and yeah, yeah it's I great. Mean, I, mean, it's, I was it's, it's, enamored I, with that. that was like, you know, I couldn't get cut enough, out, but people cut hate out it. The, I don't know why. Cut out, well, it's because of the Knights uh, section and the, uh, yeah. the stupid car racing. Like, cut all that crap out. Okay. Just all give right. me more yeah. Bonzo, yeah. man. Yeah, you caught me. I like Lord of the Rings. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, yeah it was the second <laughs> or third time you see that, it gets a little old. You know what I mean? Yeah, or Life, the, life's you know, <laughs> too short. The second or third dozen <laughs> time you see that, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Greg, fan, fan or not, Greg? But, of, yeah. of, of, of the song remains the same? 
I, 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 I endured it once. Uh, I did. I did laugh at the Lord of the Rings references. Yeah. I mean, I just thought it was hilarious to see. Where else are you going to see Robert Plant marching around with a sword the size of a uh, house yeah, or something yeah. like that? Well, but I mean, I mean you know, they didn't only make the Lord of the just, Rings references in the live show, though. It was all over their yeah. albums yeah, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you guys well, probably it comes down. You guys uh, probably uh, saw them in real life anyway, so. I never saw Zeppelin. I never no, saw Zeppelin. I, n- no. Zeppelin, uh, I never saw them either. And I had was, tickets uh, through the oh. In Through the Outdoor yeah. tour, but it was canceled. I, I missed not seeing Right, yeah, me too. Anymore. Me too. I, I, I was had, like, I was, I I was had, heartbroken. I had a I, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Came this, came this close. Um, so let's, I wanted to talk a little bit about, just get your guys' take on, you know, pandemic, quarantine, live streams, what artists are doing. Where are you guys all with that? Greg, what have you seen? Have you seen any good, like, what are you thinking about sort of artist content, live stream, whether, you know, live or produced or recorded? Have you seen anything that's noteworthy and kind of where are you on that whole all that? Well, I, I just think, you know, artists, God bless them, are trying to sort of deliver some, you know, some, you know, a version of a live performance um, via, you know, uh, the Internet. And it's, it, you know, it's never going to be quite the same. Uh, I, I think, you know, I haven't seen anything that really has blown me away in terms of like the presentation. Uh, most of most of them have opted for some kind of a bedroom vibe, you know, kind of more stripped down. And I get that, you know, limitations with budget, limitations with technology, you know, all the, all that stuff mm-hmm. uh, comes into play there. So I, I sympathize with them. The other thing that I've seen, I actually attended one of these. There was a there, there's these drive-in concerts that people are doing. Um, you know, some of the local performers in Chicago have been doing them. People like Rick Wilson. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, it's kind of it's kind of, but you're it's like going to a drive-in movie. You know, you're sitting there in your car and so yeah, people yeah. do get out and dance a little bit, but it's kind of like you're kind of in this in this sort of like. Uh, it, it's sort of a weird space. It's sort of like an in-between world between a live performance and something that you would watch on a, right, on a TV right. screen. You know, so it's 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 kind of a weird disconnect. I mean, there there is no replace. I mean, it's a cliche, but there is no replacement for yeah. that. You know, that sweat and smoke and you know yeah. um, beer <laughs> vibe of smoke of being you're, in that venue. You're you know? showing your age with well, smoke. Well, the smoke, but in terms yeah, yeah, yeah. of just a sweat yeah. sort of kind of rising to the ceiling. You know? he, well, he, meant, he this, meant the in mist this, machine is what he meant. Yeah, in yeah. the spotlight, you see the clouds of effluvia coming out of artist's mouth when they're oh really, yeah, well, you know, and that that makes you worry. But I, I spoke to I Bruce. Think, I spoke to Bruce Finkelman. He was not ruling out plexiglass between the band and yeah, the crowd. Yeah. 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 When we come back, artists spit a lot. I think that one of the um, one the most interesting things I've seen online are not artists who are trying to replicate in some way a concert, even a solo acoustic performance. But as someone in favor of uh, consistently, they formed in the punk eight, you know era. My ethos of tearing down that wall mm-hmm. between performer and artist. When you see the regular uh, zooms that Robin Hitchcock has been doing, or Tweety with his boys, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know the Tweety yeah. show. Um, <laughs> you know it's a combination of chat and talk uh, and and music. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's a hybrid. It's wisely not a, an attempt to put on a show, but to invite, uh, you know, I think living room shows are fantastic, right? Yeah. When some artists would augment, you know, they'd come to Chicago two or three days, maybe play the empty bottle and then do a living room show or two, uh, for ardent fans who put up the money and invited them into their house. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's great. You know, the ability to talk to the artist, to maybe request a song, uh, you know, to, for to have the artist tell you how I wrote that song or how the hell they were feeling that day, you know, I yeah. think that's a uh, that's the closest to something I've seen that's been okay, but it still ain't the same as. <laughs> well, you mean, um, yeah, no, nothing's this, nothing. It's it's not the same. But you know, they're gonna want to create. They're gonna want to perform. They miss live music, yeah. maybe just as much as we do. Yeah. Um, I do enjoy the, oh, the do. intimacy yeah. of performances that artists are doing on their not on their iPhone in particular, but in, in their living room or in their house. You know, it's an opportunity to see an artist yeah. in ways that you wouldn't necessarily have it just because they're forced to get out there in some way. So, you know, I think it's kind of, it's, you know, I like to make lemonade, lemonades out of this. I mean, you know, <laughs> oh, there's yeah, some yeah, positives know. that well, are coming know, out of it, not to mention the fact that live streams will be part of um, live music going forward. 
for better and worse. Yes. Yeah, no I mean, yes. better on on the Tweety uh, Tweety and Robin Hitchcock and and his wife end is the better end. But the negative end is when Live Nation begins to sell us via its subsidiary Ticketmaster two hundred dollar tickets to you know why why make Taylor Swift trapes around the world when you can have this pay per view event like a freaking HBO pay per view uh, boxing match right you know, like I mean, uh, like a BTS like a shit. BTS that makes fifty million in one night for example <laughs> right 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 I mean just yeah. fuck that shit it's even worse than you know. The residency in Vegas, at least whatever's happening well, on stage, Britney Spears is doing every night in Vegas. But, but uh, you know, it, you know, it's going that uh, way. But, 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 but on the flip side, be, on, the, uh, on the flip side of that, it's not just like live streams were just cr- created during COVID. I mean, it was an opportunity to do that also before, and that wasn't happening full bore before. So, yeah, but you have all these corporations. It, it, let's talk about the real world of yeah, business. Let's do, you know, let's do that. Or, or whatever. <laughs> all the you know, look the Tribune. Uh, first, a couple of uh, uh, years ago, got rid of Tribune Tower, a landmark building in Chicago, sold it off, then moved to the Prudential Building, you know, rented a couple of floors, office space, and now we're getting rid of that. They decided, why have a, a, a newsroom yeah, and office space? You don't need yeah, space. So, right? so it's tip the scale. Big, the big companies are deciding, you know, we don't need physical space. And Lord knows, why would you need a United Center and a Kobo Arena and a, a Timberwolves well, here's uh, Center? You know, Here, here's the thing. They're going to make more money this way. Yeah. There's going to be a hybrid model. Um, and that's going to be, you're still going to tour, but you're going to have a, 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 a sort of a multimedia component to it. So you can buy a show for the tick, for the in, in building experience. And then you will also have the option of buying a ticket for the, the pay-per-view show on your, you know, 52 inch screen mm-hmm. at home. You know, so you're going to be able to pay either way. You can sit in your living room and watch a show, or you can go through the hassle for a lot of people of a certain age. It's a big hassle going to a show yeah. now, right? Right. You know, the parking, you know, and all this stuff. I don't want to do all that stuff. I just you want to sit in the field. Yeah. I mean, what a pain in the ass. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, you know, here's the thing, though. What's what, you know, that's going to apply to, you know, the Taylor Swifts and Billie Eilish's. You and, too. Uh, and the, you know, um, Pink Stones. Floyd <laughs> reunion in the sky show. There's nobody but left. There's nobody left of Pink Floyd. But I, anyway, but what about the uh, what about the band with its first record? Yeah, out, yeah, yeah. You know, and how are they going to negotiate that uh, turf? You know, it, it's it's still going to come down to you know coming to that club, of and course, go and see it in person. And you know, uh, I think the uh, the audience for you know if you're if you're under if you're of a certain age, going out and seeing the world is is the only thing you can think about most of the day. It's like, I can't see people just, I don't know, maybe I'm missing the boat here completely, but I don't no. see like a, an entire generation sitting inside and waiting for the entertainment to be shown on their, on their cell phone. Yeah. Uh, I think there are still people go, wanting to go out and have that experience of going to see it in Yeah, in I totally person. agree. Like on maybe the, I'm missing on a larger No, no, scale, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, on a right. larger scale, I think it's going to affect the industry. We've sort of tipped the scales and gone on t- into the dark side of just only streams or adjunct streams to those the massive acts. But yeah, Greg, I totally agree. Like the smaller bands still need to actually get in front of people, right? To get fans, to, to generate yeah, excitement but, but, about their you know, live and, and people will want to see... and. People, people will still want to see that. I think yeah, that's what I. Yeah. Uh, my gut is telling me. Maybe I, again, I could be wrong. Along. Yeah, no, you, you know, I think Live Nation may well go in this way that that further separates that uh, arena level of music uh, where it's not even you can't even really call it live music anymore. You know what? What hopefully you know Live Nation has been for the past decade and a half trying to buy up clubs of every size, from the Magic Stick in Detroit or Empty Bottle in Chicago, up to the United Center, up to the Vic Theater and the Riviera Theater. Their goal was to control all live music, yeah. right? And now I think it's, it's going to have become too difficult. Those brave, hardy, heroic clubs that survived this uh, by the skin of their teeth, uh, having been closed for a year and a half and denied a dime of income for all that period, the hideouts, the empty bottles, uh, whatever we have left when when the clouds part, uh, may now 
be free from the corporate interference, and that will operate as a true underground. And, you know, as someone who has for 12 years been teaching uh, 18 to 20-year-olds at Columbia College, right, you know, we talk about this a lot, and it always helps uh, to make them uh, bring it home if you compare it to sex, right? <laughs> can, can you have phone sex or virtual sex with someone you are enamored of? Yes. Yeah, right, yeah. you certainly can. Is it as good as being in the same room yeah. with that person? No, 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 wow, no. Wow, this no, is no, making no, no, no. so much sense right? now, Jim. So you know, yeah. <laughs> well, the the internet meme is you know everybody's thirst trap now, right? I mean, I've had some great meals that, that we've been trying to support restaurants we love when they've done takeout. It ain't as good as sitting there. Yeah, that's true. Right, and and the same with uh, you know, so so businesses are trying to survive. That live music venues are trying to survive. They will come back, and I think people will embrace them wholeheartedly mm -hmm. with a desperation uh, and an enthusiasm, and hopefully it's going to make them value more. You know, we have been very lucky in Chicago, uh, you know, to have such a thriving uh, independent scene of of clubs, right? Because you go to Minneapolis, and, it, you know, like there's first day of, uh, you know, and then the list begins to drop off. You go to Detroit, yeah. Magic Stick, Magic Stick ain't opening again, right? You go to smaller cities, Madison or uh, Chapel Hill, you know, and the list is even sorrier. Independent clubs like independent record stores, independent bookstores have been being driven out of biz business by, by big business. And, uh, you know, there's no replacement for them. And hopefully when the clouds part, those who survived will now thrive. Well, I wanted to circle back to also... I the, the Live Nation connection that you met, that you were talking about, why would, I, maybe I didn't understand what you were saying correctly, but I understood that you're saying that Live Nation is kind of backing off an effort to buy uh, smaller independent clubs. Is that what you were saying? Well, there's no independent clubs to be had right now, right? I mean, you, you've seen well, some barracudas out there, like what's his face? Yeah, you know, Geiger. 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 Mark, Mark Geiger, Geiger wanted to buy 51% of any independent venue that was going under, right? 51 being the key, yeah, because yeah, then course. he would control right. it, right? Yep. You know, I mean, this is this is what happened when uh, independent radio stations began to have troubles uh, in the 80s. You know, Fred FX Sillerman goes around as Clear Channel, same people who bring you the billboards, mm, yeah. and buys them all up, right? And then we have one major giant corporation, Clear Channel becomes Live Nation, um, you know, uh, that, that controls uh, a ridiculous proportion, 70%, 80% of radio in America. So you have one guy in New York, hi, this is Joe Schmuck in New York, voicing 100 stations. He's the voice of Madison and, and South Dakota and uh, Vermont, you know, and fuck that, man. And that's the Live Nation model for live music. But I think live music has taken such a hit, you know, that that uh, if you look at Live Nation's uh, stock, it's a publicly traded corporation, you know, it's, uh, it's doing well. But that's because of this pivot to virtual experience, I think, and not because of wanting to, to, to or dying to bring uh, the live experience back. So, Jim, you mentioned uh, Minneapolis, Detroit, Madison, cities where independent venues have uh, been hurt uh, by the buying up, uh, like Live Nation going out on a buying spree. Um, how's Chicago done compared to what other cities are experiencing in the independent venue area? And love to hear your thoughts on it, too, Greg. Well, pre-COVID, uh, Chicago miraculously was holding steady with a thriving uh, underground of uh, independent mom-and-pop clubs uh, from really tiny ones, you know, the Liars Club or the Hideout, yeah. up to, uh, uh, you know, uh, more significant venues, Talia Hall. Yeah. Um, but the pressure has been there for a good uh, decade or two from Live Nation. They would love to see, they'd love to make Metro a Live Nation venue. Yeah. They'd love to make Talia Hall a Live Nation venue. Um, now, you know, we are uh, midway or perhaps two-thirds of the way, if you want to be optimistic, through this shutdown. There has been no live music since St. Patrick's Day weekend of 2020. Uh, if we listen to the most optimistic predictions from a Dr. Fauci, there won't be until uh, uh, the end of the summer or the beginning of the fall of 2021. And even then... You know, for the empty bottle, for the hideout to open its doors at 25% or 50% of capacity ain't going to keep 
the mortgage paid, the lights on, the staff employed. These are venues that operate on very thin margins, and uh, they need a full room, you know, to make their nut. Mm-hmm. Um, if if uh, they aren't able to do that for even longer than the fall, uh, you know, if they're not able to have that full room, uh, you know, some of them are just never going to reopen, period. It, it's, it's inevitable. You talk to the club owners, and they're telling us that. And then what happens? Is that club snatched up by the giant corporate conglomerate, or is it just, you know, does it become yet another, uh, you know, yuppie uh, boutique, as, uh, as happened to the Double Door? Right, you know? right. Uh, I, we, we are not out of the woods yet. Do you see some, uh, do you see some venues in Chicago kind of on the precipice of that point right now? Every single one of them. Well, you know, on the I precipice think, of, being, of being bought. Are you oh, he- of being yeah, bought? I mean, are no, you hearing anything? No. But of, of not reopening, I think, every single one of them. If yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, that the, wasn't, the yeah. members of Civil. Yep, yep, yeah, yep. no, I don't know. No, I don't know about, about being bought. Mm-hmm. I think uh, you don't see the vulture coming until you're lying there uh, gasping your last breath. <laughs> right. I guess <laughs> then the, question, the vultures yeah. descend. The question that comes to me is, is it better to have, uh, lo- is it better to have struggling venues bought by Live Nation uh, and still have music going on, or is it better for independent venues to close? Is it better to not have an independent uh, hardware store, dry cleaner, grocery store, liquor store, or only Walmart in your town? I think the answer to those uh, rural uh, cities and towns uh, are, are hell no. You know, when the only place I can go is right, to shop at right, the right. rabidly right wing, uh, you know, uh, outlet. And, and, you know, look. You know, there's going to come the time when Walmart doesn't sell the cheapest toilet paper. When Walmart is the only place in town to buy toilet paper, they're going to charge whatever the hell they want. Same argument with Amazon. And and they're going to not book uh, things that they don't want. I mean, you know, hey, Walmart didn't want to sell in utero by Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, that too, right? I mean, plus, uh, yeah, I was going to say that's along the lines of uh, not only you can drive the prices up, but you can also choose the bands that you want to have play. Yeah, you know, I, I from time to time get accused as an anti-corporate, anti-globalist. Oh, why uh, would that be? Panic, <laughs> panic uh, naysayer. Um, but we are seeing this happen. You know, it's decimating journalism. It's decimating many industries. Uh, this kind of corporate mentality, and and you know, Live Nation has proven itself to be. Uh, twice investigated by the Justice Department uh, as a monopoly, uh, to be an uh, anti-competitive, anti-art corporation, really. I mean, you know, and if you're doubting me, uh, listen, anybody ever buy a ticket from Ticketmaster? Did you wonder why the $35 ticket suddenly cost you uh, $62.50, you know, to print out on your own printer at home with their convenience fees, their service fees? And, hey, try to look up Live Nation's phone number or Ticketmaster's in Chicago to call and complain uh, as a customer could with Jam or Bruce Finkelman in the Empty Bottle or Joe Shanahan at Metro. A human being answers the phone and uh, works you through your problem, and uh, Live Nation Ticketmaster do not care you're absolutely right you're absolutely fucking right greg where are you on that well part of my uh thinking on this is that live nation uh as much as they want to own everything probably doesn't want to own a really small club that whose profit margin is minimal uh you know they're Hmm. they're and what will happen will will those those clubs will die uh live nation is into profit making money and and exploiting uh, the industry uh, as as much as it can. Uh, in the case of the small clubs, I think there's too much, uh, you know, roll up the sleeves work involved in in running a club uh, week to week, day to day. As Jim said, it's it's literally a bottom line that uh, is dependent on that night's crowd and filling up the filling up the venue. Yeah. And if you aren't doing that every night of the week, it, it you know does that interest a huge m- multinational corporation? Probably not. The problem with that is that thinking is that if you take away those clubs, those bottom feeder clubs, quote unquote, the ones that have 100, 150 capacity, you lose a vital stepping stone in the bands that eventually do fill up those big theaters and, 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 and arenas. And, and if that's not there, right. your whole industry is in jeopardy. So to my mind, even these big corporations have a vested interest in seeing that these clubs survive somehow. And it probably doesn't involve owning them. I, I would hope hmm. that they would think, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. a little bit uh, globally and, and uh, holistically about what this means for their industry, because it, it will be dire 
if these clubs go away. And and uh, you know it'll right. it'll it'll basically be the trap door for the whole industry uh, eventually falling apart. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting perspective that Live Nation can benefit from the uh, uh, continued existence of independent they venues. They absolutely do. Yeah. Uh, they may not think of it that way, but if they did, they'd realize it's true. Well, they no, they have. They have. You know, Greg. Greg, if you read if you read the corporate prospectus, uh, you know, Live Nation's business model is to control every venue in a music market from 100 or 150 capacity up to 20,000. They've always said they want that. They know that the bottom level yes. is a loss leader, but uh, you know, but then that's where they stick their <laughs> after show yeah. during Lollapalooza by uh, a uh, by a band. You know, I mean. Um, it's not. We're not inventing this. The the you know go you know you want a, some horrifying uh, reading that'll keep you up at night <laughs> worse than the scariest Stephen King book. Look at the uh, Live Nation uh, literature that they put out to their uh, investors and and their you know you know. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I guess it, I'm wondering if Live Nation got out there and was lobbying for Save Our Stages under that um, uh, with that theory. No, it was interesting. You know, Schumer and Klobuchar, uh, the main Democratic architects of Save Our Stages, particularly wrote uh, the the Save Our Stages part of the yes. uh, bailout legislation, uh, excluding yeah the the, yeah. the corporate giants. Uh, you know, not only Live Nation, but the handful of others. Um, no, I mean, they were making clear this is not for the right. giant Interesting. global concert promoter. Um, have you seen Chicago get hit in a certain way more than other cities in the uh, in the country? Yeah, because there's more. Because <laughs> there's yeah. more, yeah, right. I mean, there's today... More. They, got, they got more to lose. Today in Detroit, there's, you know, three or four clubs. In Milwaukee, uh, there's, there's what? Three. Uh, that I can think of, uh, you know, on a yeah. level below, uh, on a level of an empty bottle um, or smaller. Um, you know, I think we're hit harder because there's more uh, venues here, and uh, that's always been a good thing. But right now, uh, it isn't because they're all dark and there's no club uh, 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 sound technicians and door people and bartenders working anywhere. All right, well, that's uh, that's some um, all, like, Great stuff. I appreciate your guys' perspectives on that. I mean, uh, cheery you know, stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, good, good. I meant good information. I didn't mean good no, news. No, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we got you, Josh. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, it was such a such a pleasure and an honor to be here and talk to you guys. I respect your work so much, and uh, thanks a lot for joining me. I really thanks appreciate for the interest, it. Josh. Yeah, appreciate well, it. Thanks for doing what you do. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, anytime, you guys. Anytime. Open invitation to come back to Roadcase and talk about state of the music industry, uh, live music industry. It really, uh, really. Let's do it when there <laughs> is a live music industry again, Josh, well, and we can all celebrate there, there how is a eager we were to get back to the clubs. I yeah. did say state of the industry. Let's get there back and go. talk. Uh, let's get back and talk about the best fucking shows that are going on in Chicago. Like bingo. Next weekend. All That's right. What we want to do. Yes. There's a spirit. There you go. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Greg. You bet. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I want to thank Jim DeRogatis and Greg Cott again for being here on Roadcase. Uh, just to have them was a total honor for me, and uh, I love listening to them talk about music. Um, I love sound opinions, and I'd highly recommend listening to uh, to their podcast. You can catch that uh, on any of the listening platforms and visit their website at uh, soundopinions.org. It's really striking, you know, to speak to them now uh, with the absence of live shows, uh, what that means. I mean, these guys have been to so many thousands of shows over the years. And uh, to talk to them now during the shutdown uh, really kind of draws into uh, interesting perspective um, how important live shows are. And, uh, you know, we talked a bunch about um, uh, independent venues and I really do hope they stick around I think I'd have to side with Greg on that one that they are important to the uh, overall ecosystem of uh, live shows with the smaller ben venues kind of being feeder clubs for the larger uh, arenas and venues but like a live nation wouldn't want to uh, deal with the smaller um, profit margins at smaller clubs so 
fingers crossed that they'll get the funding that they need to stick around and that um, uh, they won't get bought out uh, by the the bigger corporation um, that uh, among other things and it's a good point that Jim makes uh, I think it was Jim um, you know there's just no customer service on that level you know everyone's been there you've called the 800 number uh, for Live Nation or Ticketmaster or whatever and like you can't get any information that you want and I'm and then we're not even talking about the service fees. So Jim talked about how uh, live music is so important. It's kind of the heart and soul of what uh, of what he does and that the live show is where it's at. Um, and, you know, I, of course, I, I, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, Jim also said that it's the uh, it's the album that's immortal and it's the live show that's ephemeral. But you do need both. You know, you, it's so great to be able to go back to an album it's as, as, a, as a work of art and understand what that band was trying to do and trying to accomplish in the statement they're trying to make in that moment but, um, and have that stand for eternity. But a live show is just an amazing thing. And um, uh, I think we all agree. That's why we're here. Uh, that's why I'm here. Um, I'm rooting for independent venues. Um, I love live shows. Want to get back to them as, as, uh, as soon as we can. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this as a silver lining. So I'm always kind of trying to look at this a little bit more optimistically and not get sucked into the rabbit hole of negativity on this whole thing. But... Uh, so much music out there to listen to. Can't wait to get back to hearing it live. Um, if you enjoyed this episode with road case, I want to invite you again to get involved in the road case community, uh, social socials, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we're at road case pod. And we also have a website where you can get some more information. You can see all the different platforms where we offer, um, the road case podcast. And that's at www, uh, road case pod.com so come one come all come down check it out uh we're also on all your favorite listening platforms so there you go i want to thank jim de regattas and greg cott again for being here on road case and i want to thank everybody for tuning in to this very special episode of road case we got tons more coming up on road case and i'm so excited to share all these episodes with you so thank you again for your support thanks everyone for being here for this episode of road case Thanks again so much for listening. And I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with Roadcase. You can do so in a number of different ways. You can email me at info at roadcasepod.com with questions, comments, and even suggestions for guests. Or you can follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at Roadcase Pod. And we have a YouTube channel called Roadcase Podcast. And if you are able to and like to support Roadcase, we have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And if you could please rate and review the podcast while you're there, that would be great. So I want to thank Waltzer for this awesome theme music that we have. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Roadcase. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, so I'll see you on down the road. <laughs>